Hey songwriters, welcome back to another video here at At Home Songwriting. I'm Chad Shank, your friendly host based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Today's video is a full workshop about verse development and advancing your verses. So one of the things that really great songs do is they have a chorus that means a little bit more every time you hear it. So choruses are usually repeated almost exactly. There's not a lot of change. There's not a lot of new information that comes in choruses. And it's the part where you want everybody to sing along. So you don't want to change it too much. You want it to pretty much stay the same. But how do you make it gain this emotional punch if it says the same thing every time? Well, the answer lies in how you set up your choruses in the verses. So today this workshop is all about developing your verses and trying to point them and lead them to making your chorus a bit stronger. So before we jump in, I wanted to remind you that there is at home songwriter merch. Yes, you can wear this hat and look super cool and let people know that you're a songwriter. There's a little bit of fuzz on it, but hey, look on the bottom of this site and order your merch today. But with no further ado, Let's get to the workshop. Let's go. How do you make your songs more effective by focusing on verse development? So we're going to talk about what really makes a successful song. And we're going to talk about how do you use your sections to really bring your listener into the emotion that you're trying to communicate. And the key to songwriting is communication. So as you think about songwriting, it's really a conversation between the singer and the listener. So the singer is your storyteller. The singer is the narrator. And we want to make sure that you're representing the singer in a positive light, but also communicating what you intend to communicate. Sometimes we write songs in a way that we are very clear in our own mind about what we're trying to say. But when it comes to actually what the song is saying, it sort of misses the mark. So we're going to talk about how to be specific. So what do successful songs do? So successful songs are usually about one clear central idea or one central situation. So it's usually about one thing that you can go a little bit deeper on. So a lot of successful songs are about going deep instead of going wide, right? So trying to see, are you trying to say too much? And Victor, I'm not picking on you at this point. <laughs> um, but usually a song does have that central main idea. Also, that central idea can usually be explained in about one or two sentences. If it takes you a whole paragraph or a whole page to explain what your song is about, you probably actually have more than one song in the works. Um, usually songs are pretty easily explained within a couple of sentences, or at least what the main point is. Also successful songs have a memorable title or at least a memorable hook. And when we talk about hook, we're talking about sort of that summarizing statement or summarizing lines that really sum up what the song is all about. It's the thesis statement of the song that everything else supports. So usually song uh, successful songs have that. Also, a lot of songs are authentic and you believe them, right? They don't sound insincere. They don't sound written. They don't sound um, contrived. They sound like they're a real story being told by a real person and it's about real emotions. And it usually puts the singer in some sort of positive light. Sometimes if singer songwriters are singing their own songs, they may write about how depressed and, and like worthless they feel, but usually there's still a sense of hope somewhere in there. So it, it still shines a light on you know, can the singer pull through what's going on and can the story um, have some form of, of positive ending? Also, one thing that successful songs do is they make the title or they make the hook mean a little bit more each time you hear it, even though it says the exact same thing. So most of the time your chorus and your hook isn't going to change 
as you go throughout your song. It's most of the time going to be the part that people sing along to. It's the part that's easy to remember. It's repeated, like all of those things. So how do you then get your title to mean more each time you hear it? And the, the thing about all of this is really successful songs resonate with a large number of people. And the more sort of specific and the more uh, effectively you can communicate emotion, that means the more people will connect with what you're writing. So if your same title and your same hook is saying the exact same thing each time, how do we get it to mean more? So the answer to that is it all lives in the verses because the verses are there to build up the title. They're there to build up to the hook and they change what the chorus and the hook means. So we're gonna talk about how do we do that and what sort of a way to think about each section and the job that it's doing and how do you make that happen? So let's first uh, start off about talking about the job of the first verse. But before we do that, are there any questions or, or anything on what I've covered so far? Perfect. So let's talk about the first verse. So the job of the first verse is to establish a who, a when, a where, and a what. So in a lot of ways, songwriting is like journalism. For any of you who have studied journalism, reporters are taught to ask, you know, a lot of who, where, when, what, why, how questions, because they want to make sure that they're answering the questions that their reader or their listener or their viewer may have, right? So songwriting is exactly the same. We're sort of like emotional reporters that are reporting on events and emotions. So your first verse is your first chance to really establish who, when, where, and what. And the sooner you can establish those things, the sooner your listener can start to pull themselves into the song and decide if they relate to it or not. And if you do a good job of telling your story, the listener will hear, hear it as their story, um, which is an interesting phenomenon. So it's really about setting a scene. So it's really putting your listener into who's singing, who are they singing to, when is this happening, where is it happening, and what is going on. And your first verse also is the first time you establish any sort of motif or any sort of patterns within your song as well. You're establishing not only lyrical rhythm, you're establishing rhyme scheme, you're establishing melody, you're establishing the groove. And what that establishment does is it gives you a place to start from as you are thinking about creating contrast and developing the song. Because you really have two choices as you move through the song. You can either meet your listener's expectations or you can surprise your listener. So your verse is the first place where it sets that pattern where you can either break it or keep it. Also, verses, usually the first verse is more showing than it is telling. So what this means is showing language is very descriptive, it's image-based, it can be experienced through the senses, so it's the sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, movement. It's, it's all about what's physically going on outside of the characters, and a lot of times it's fact, whereas telling language is more of the emotions, the abstract kind of feelings language. So think of showing as facts, telling as feelings. Your verse a lot of times will have more showing because the telling language actually comes in the chorus because the chorus is usually more about the emotion, the main uh, moral of the story, the main idea, those types of things. And of course, the first verse leads to the very first hook, the very first chorus, the very first title. Um, so it's really that first development section that you have. So it really gives your song a start by letting the listener decide if they're interested in hearing the rest of the song. So your first verse really has a lot of work to do when you think about uh, the process. So I wanted to share a video 
um, that I had made previously that kind of sums up how the who, when, where, and what actually shows up in writing by some um, successful songwriters. So let's take a look at at this video and then we'll we'll come back and, and move on. Pull your listeners into your song. Hey songwriters, welcome back to At Home Songwriting. Since you clicked on this video, you want to learn how you can harness the power of place and time in your songwriting. So what is that power? Almost all of us songwriters want to bring our listeners into our songs. We want them to feel something and we want them to have the types of experiences that we have when we listen to other songs by our favorite artists and songwriters. Many times as we listen, we don't even realize that songs are giving us information that helps us connect with the song. The song is answering questions that we don't even realize that we're asking. So the questions that quickly can establish place and time in our songs are where and when, and also who. Who is singing? Who is being sung to? When is this happening? Where is this happening? And it seems very simple, and it is a simple concept, but it's so powerful. You may not have paid attention to how these questions are being answered in songs, but let's take a look at some songs by some amazing songwriters like Taylor Swift, Jason Isbell, and James Taylor. So let's look at Alabama Pines by Jason Isbell. Some of you may be familiar with this song. Um, this is one of his most popular songs, and it is just a great song that takes you on a journey and it, it gives you just the right amount of emotions and you uh, you really just get caught up in his storytelling, which I think is amazing. So Alabama Pines, the lyrics go, well, I moved into this room, if you could call it that a week ago. I never do what I'm supposed to do, hardly even know my name anymore. When no one calls it out, it kind of vanishes away. So if you look at that line by line, what is the first verse doing? It says, well, I moved into this room. So it's setting a who and a where, right? He's saying he's in this room. It's him, the who, the singer, into this room. If you could call it that a week ago. So he's kind of setting a time frame that we're in the present and he's talking about the past, right? And then what is, I never do what I'm supposed to do. Well, why is he saying that? He says, well, I hardly even know my name anymore. Why? Because no one calls it out and it kind of vanishes away. So each line is getting us information that we subconsciously want, but we don't know we're asking. So he's setting up a who, where, when, what, and then the why lines wrap up the section. Now, some of you are going to say, did Jason think about this when he wrote this? The answer is probably not, but here's the thing, it doesn't matter because Jason had the instinct to include that information for his listener. What we're trying to do is to develop that instinct for your songwriting. So if you use the structure in a very conscious and purposeful way, eventually it will become your second writing nature so you don't even have to think about it as much so that's the goal of doing these classes and doing these exercises is to get it into your subconscious so you don't have to consciously work at it anymore it just happens so let's look at fire and rain by james taylor so the lyrics go just yesterday morning they let me know you were gone suzanne the plans they made put an end to you I walked out this morning and I wrote down this song. I just can't remember who to send it to. So look again at what each line is saying. It's saying just yesterday morning, that's a when. They, that's a who, let me know you were gone. That's a what. Also, Suzanne, another who, the plans they made put an end to you. That's a what. And then I walked out this morning, that's a who and a when, and I wrote down this song, that's a what happened, and then I just can't remember who to send it to, which kind of wraps up why does all of this matter? So again, you see a lot of the first questions happening in the first part of the section, and then really summarizing it and bringing it all together with that last line or the why.
So let's take a look at the song that really got me thinking about questions and how to use them in a songwriting system. So it's You Belong With Me. It was written by Taylor Swift and Liz Rose. So the lyrics go, you're on the phone with your girlfriend. She's upset. She's going off about something that you said because she doesn't get your humor like I do. I'm in the room. It's a typical Tuesday night. I'm listening to the kind of music she doesn't like, and I'll never know or she'll never know your story like I do. So if you look at this line by line, it's really written like a journalist would write. So it starts off with a who. Your. That that means that the singer is talking to someone else. So we instantly know that it's in direct address, right? So the first question that the song is answering is who? Well, who is doing what? Well, they're on the phone with their girlfriend. So that could be a what and a where, right? So where's this person at? Well, they're on the phone. And why are they on the phone? She's upset. So in your first line, you have a who, a where, a why and kind of a what, right? So you're answering like four questions just in the first line. So going to the second line then, she's going off about something that you said. So there again, there's another who, and then it's what is happening. So she's going off about something that she said. So when you think about writing, can you use this structure to write your own song? Well, of course you can. You could put a who, a when, and a where in your first line. You could put a who and a what in the second line. And then you could say a why. Well, because she doesn't get your humor like I do, right? So you're setting up details in the beginning of your song, and you're using that to establish why all of this matters. And then you get to the second half of this verse, and it says, I'm in the room. And these are in three line segments. You could almost consider these to be like two verses, um, but it's kind of the first verse section. But she's starting off with a who, and then she's advancing the who in the second half. So we're it started with you. Now we're going to I'm in the room. So it's who, where, and when. So the next line is who, where, when. Pretty cool, huh? So it's I'm in the room. It's a typical Tuesday night. So what's going on? I'm listening to the kind of music she doesn't like. Cool. Well, why? She no, she'll never know your story like I do. So these are all questions that this song is answering that the listener, and we don't even know we're asking it, but we need that information for the song to so we need the information for the song to make sense. Um, I think what's important to remember about all of this is sometimes we get caught up in this uh, mystical world of songwriting and we think that we have to find just the right words to sort of cast a spell on our listener, right? We're looking for the right words that have just the cool, like I wanna find a cool word in the thesaurus and I wanna just say the magic word that's like, oh my gosh, the song is great. Sometimes we forget that this, what makes a song really great is about how well it communicates. Um, so it's not actually about a lot of times the individual words, it's what is the message that is being carried in the words because you're a listener will feel the message they don't necessarily feel the individual words if that makes sense and what you want your listener to remember is the feeling that they get so once you establish the who the when and the where and the what and sometimes the why in your first verse then when you get to your second verse and future verses as well. And I also include the bridge in this. So second, third verse bridge. Um, I think if you start getting, I think if you start getting more than two to three verses, you're probably saying too much. Your song is probably a little too long. Not to say that there's not 10 or 11 minute songs out there, but those are usually the exception um, than more so than the rule. 
but your second verse and future verses and your bridge will usually advance that who, when, where, and what. So it takes your listener deeper into your topic. And a lot of times I hear songwriters say that they struggle with what to say in the second verse. And a lot of times that can sometimes be because you're saying too much in your first verse. So take a look at your first verse and see, is there any information that you can split out and maybe go a little bit deeper on one or two items in the first verse and then move the other items to uh, future verses to see if you can break it up. So really try to break up that content so you're giving your listener that journey through the topic. If you tell everything in the first verse, there's nowhere to go. So what are the tools of verse development then? So when we're talking about developing your verses, we've already mentioned that we talk a lot about who. So when you're thinking about how do you advance the who, you can change the point of view or perspective of each verse. So one very effective way to do this is by the me, you, us, or you, me, us uh, template. And you can play with the order, um, but this is a good thing to keep in mind when you're writing because you could start your first verse from your perspective. How are you feeling about the situation? Second verse could be talking about the other person that's in the situation. And then your bridge or your third verse can be about how is the collective experiencing this. So advancing the me, you, us is a kind of a, a quick way to remember that. When can be past, present, future. So same concept and you can change the order and you can repeat them as well. So you might have your first verse in the past, second verses in the present, and then your bridge or your third verse might say, what does the future look like? Or where do we go from here? Um, you're also establishing kind of the, the vantage point, which means, are you in the present looking back? Are you in the present looking forward? Are you in the past looking forward? You know, where, where in time are you sitting? You can play with that. You can also play with the time of day. You can also play with relationship to events. So what I mean by that is, let's say your song is about a breakup, right? So are you right after the breakup or are you two weeks after the breakup are you a year after the breakup you can change the time frame in relationship to the event that you're writing about so that's one way to advance your verses as well also when we talk about where we can uh, have a location change so are you you know maybe the first verse is on someone's front porch and then maybe it moves to the car or you know some other location um you don't always have to change all three of the who the when and the where you can but a lot of times if you just change at least one of them throughout your song it will help give your listener a journey through your topic one of the things we're trying to avoid is every verse saying the same thing with different words because even though it's different words your listener still is getting the same message and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Don't care. Right. And that's the last thing you want to do is, is get your listener at the apathy stage. Also, you can change perspective from talking versus thinking. So what does this mean? This means, am I, is the singer talking about what's happening around them or are they think, are they having thoughts about feelings and what's going on inside them? So you may have a verse that is describing the situation. And then the next verse may take us into how the person's feeling about the situation they described. So talking versus thinking you can play with as well. So I wanted to look at a song um, that was written by Lainey Wilson and Josh Keir. And for those of you who aren't familiar with, whoops, there we go. So the song we're going to look at is Watermelon Moonshine. So Josh Keir, some of you may not recognize the name, but you would probably recognize his songwriting because he wrote the song Before He Cheats um, with Carrie, Un or Carrie Underwood cut it, um, which was a huge country hit. Um, and not that everybody has to write country, but 
country songwriters are pretty skilled at using tools. So a lot of times we, we look at um, country. So Watermelon Moonshine. So let's look at how this song is set up in the perspective of the who, the when, the where, and the what. So it was right after senior year, just before the summer disappeared. We went a ride in them old farm ruts, hanging out on the gate of his truck. We threw a blanket neath the sunset, being brave as 18 gets. We gave each other more than our hearts with the help of a mason jar, drinking watermelon moonshine. So looking at this first line, and you can put this in the chat, it was right after senior year. What question is that line answering? Dory says when? Yeah, lots of people saying when. Perfect. Yep, it's definitely when. Just before the summer disappeared. What, it, what question is that answering? Yep, it's still continuing the when. So it's kind of, it's kind of the, the first two lines are doing, it's kind of, and Judith says it's setting the time period. Absolutely. So it's right after senior year, just before the summer disappeared. So that tells you it's probably the end of summer, right? So it's, it's not right after graduation. It's, it's a little bit further in. Then it gets to, we went, we went a ride in them old farm ruts. What question does that answer? where and what yep anything else that it's it's kind of giving us in that as well there you go haley says who absolutely so that's the first time that's the first time we actually get a pronoun which usually pronouns are where the who lives right so now we know that it's the singer and someone else and then hanging out on the gate of his truck so what questions does that line answer where judith it could be why victor says who yep so it's advancing the the who a little bit more because now we know that it's the singer and someone else but now we know that the other person is a he yeah, and it's it's his truck. So that's a lot of information just in four lines, right? And what I think is is interesting about a lot of these songs is it's written in very clear language, like someone would actually say it. I don't know if if somebody would say a ride in, but somebody may say we went right in them, <laughs> right in them old farm ruts. That's the country coming out where the the grammar's not quite perfect. Um, but then it continues through the, um, it continues through the thought of we threw a blanket neath the sunset being brave as 18 gets. We gave each other more than our hearts with the help of a mason jar. So it's telling us what is going on and it's setting up the Judas says singable words. Absolutely. So it's setting up the hook. The hook of the song is drinking watermelon moonshine. That's there's a whole bunch of other words that go into the chorus, but really the hook of the song is we were drinking watermelon moonshine. So now if we look at the second verse, we went from we, so the, our who was we and him. Now we get to the second verse and we're talking about I. So we changed a little bit of point of view now that we got to the second verse. So it's saying, I don't remember where we got it from. I just remember feeling all grown up, taking pulls like it ain't no thing, never told him it was my first drink. So we still know it's the same person from verse one. We didn't have to tell the listener again, hey, it's the same person because details run down. So when you're writing your song, you whatever you say first continues in your listener's mind as the song goes on so and then it says but i told him he was the one 
you're so sure when you're that young, you think you got it all figured out. And now I laugh when I think about. So look at how they played with the when here. It all of a sudden, it, the, the point of view or the vantage point is we're singing from the present, right? She's singing from the present about the past. But at the end of this second verse, and now I laugh when I think about drinking watermelon moonshine. So the hook changes a little bit. It goes from we gave each other more than our hearts with help of a mason jar drinking watermelon moonshine. And now I laugh when I think about drinking watermelon moonshine. And then you get to this bridge where it says, I thought that high would last forever, but that ain't what it does. Uh, maybe we were drunk in love, or maybe we were just drinking watermelon moonshine. So the words that you use right before your chorus and the verse that's before your choruses helps to color what the, the chorus actually means. So if we go back here to um, the slides, it has verse one was we gave each other more than our hearts with the help of, help of a mason jar, drinking watermelon moonshine. Now I laugh when I think about drinking watermelon moonshine. And then maybe we were drunk in love or we were just drinking watermelon moonshine. So you have these three different angles on the same topic that keeps us interested as the song goes on. And this is such a powerful tool that you can use in your own songwriting. And a lot of times you are making these decisions on how you're setting up your chorus before you actually dive in to writing your lyrics. It's usually a good idea to sort of pre determine if your title and if your hook is even worth developing like this because some ideas may not be very good at developing which means it might be just part of another song but maybe it's not a, a full song um so i wanted to now that we just sort of went through this song and we sort of dissected the lyrics um the way that they're written now I wanted to sort of play the song for you and have you follow along to see how they developed it uh, from the lyrical perspective, but then also how does it sort of play out as the song itself? So yeah, so I saw in the chat, uh, some of you were putting, putting thoughts, but what, uh, you know, going over what we had talked about and now looking at the song from actually, or listening to it with our ears, um, you know, what were some of your reactions to it? I see Victor in the chat says, with a few small adjustments, this could have been an indie folk song. Um, the power transcends the genre. Um, I think that's a sign of a really good song, right? Like you could do it as a country song. You could do it as another genre. Um, the song sort of stands on its own. Um, Victor, what do you think the power, when you say power, what did you hear in the song as you're listening? Um, for me, pardon me, for me, a lot of the power um, comes from the way she developed it. So it's all of the things you were talking about before. Um, at first, it's kind of a late teen kind of, you know, little roll in the hay, but it, it really deepens as it moves through the verses, right? This really means a lot to her as she looks back on it. So you really kind of get, it's like a spiral. You just get circled into this this emotion. And for me, that's what made it so powerful. And, uh, and this is going to be a funny question to you, Victor, but her story probably wasn't your story, right? Like that was not autobiographical to you. No, <laughs> no, never had that experience. I, I, I'm happy or sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but you still felt something, right? And I think that's, that's important is when you, when the song is written in a specific way, and from the, the writer's very specific point of view, the more specific it is, the more we relate to it. Um, one of the mistakes that a lot of writers make is, you know, they want to write a song that people connect to, so they get very vague. 
but that's actually the exact opposite thing you want to do. The more specific you become, the more people actually um, relate to the song, which is kind of this weird paradox. Right. So drinking moonshine, you don't have to drink moonshine to know the intoxicating effect of of alcohol, which is a metaphor for the intoxicating effect of love, which we've all felt, right? Exactly. Yeah, totally. Uh, Judith, you had your hand raised. Yes, it was very obvious. And, um, you know, in the example of and what I call, I was trying to spell ellipse, but you could definitely hear the ellipse uh, before the actual hook and it was it was um uh it was demonstrated through the words as well as the music you know sure. um yeah there was you know, like no break so that was your point taken you know that, that was very very uh so one good, thing great examples yeah so one thing to remember as you're talking about the music um i saw that uh in the chat, Jeanette had said the choice of instruments and, and arrangements can change the genre. So a lot of times genre is defined by the production or the arrangement, right? Like that really does set sort of what the song sounds like. If we did this song with electric guitars and maybe sped it up a little bit, we could easily have a rock song. Um, the other thing about um, songs in general is your lyrics tell the story and your music tells you how to feel about it. So we think about lyrics and we feel music. So the marriage between what the words are saying and how the music supports it, that's the concept that we talk about all the time called prosody. And it's hard to outright the emotional power of your music. So the music always does more for setting the emotion than your lyric actually does. It's just naturally how we listen to music. It's just how it works. The feeling comes from the music and the message comes from the lyric. Um, so you're hitting people in the heart with the music and you're hitting people in the head with the lyric, which is a way to sort of think about it. So if you hit both of those well, then you have this experience or the emotional experience um, for the listener. Um, Haley, you had your hand raised. Yeah, um, I just, it's funny you just mentioned what you just said about that, because without having heard that song before, um, when we were first, like, before you played it, just reading through it, I guess in my head, I had this, like, idea of, like, oh, maybe it's going to be more, like, kind of jovial, you know, just, like, reminiscing, and, like, oh, wasn't that fun, and I guess it, it still was reminiscent, of course, but, like, just, like, the melody was a bit more kind of, like, I don't think somber is the right word but you know it was just a bit, bit more like really yeah a little, i don't know a little bit more serious than like i was expecting it to be and i was like oh okay and then it you know and it worked um but yeah it was just interesting that you mentioned that because i had that thought too of like wasn't how i was expecting to feel about it but it worked all the same so. yeah the music I know what you're saying, like it doesn't have a happy sound to it, but it's also not a totally sad sound. It's almost like she's missing that part of her life, right? There's almost a little bit of a like, uh, kind of a feeling that comes from the music for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Haley. Um, Jen says the course seems really, really long, too long for her. <laughs> uh, Colin says, nice song. I don't feel much contrast between the verse and the chorus, the music and rhyme wise. Yeah, there's not a huge amount of, of contrast in this one. Um, and that I think is just the style of song. I think it's meant to be sort of that mellow mood where it's not, it's not taking on a, us really on a melodic journey. It's really not a melody based song. It's really more about the pictures. Um, so, but yeah, really great, uh, really great input here, everybody. So now let's keep uh, keep rolling things along. Go back to my presentation here. Oops, what did I share? There we go. All right. So what I wanted to talk about next, and Adam, I didn't miss your your chat, um, but. What I wanted to do here is give you this outline 
template of sort of what you can do as you're thinking about writing your own songs. And that's really to create this thought process of really thinking about who are my characters? Who is the singer? Is the singer just a narrative narrator, a narrator, or is the singer actually involved in what's happening? So that you control with point of view, right? So if you have it in first person, it makes it more personal to the singer. Um, is it second person where they're addressing sort of a universal you where it's kind of talking to someone and usually the listener knows that the singer is not really talking to them, but they know they're talking to this other person. Or is it third person where the singer is just telling the story of other people? You can also think about where is it happening? When is it happening? What is happening? And how does it relate to the main idea of your song? And then just create this outline of how do I want to advance these things as I'm writing my song. So I use this format all the time when I write because it helps me not say the same thing in every verse because I'm prone to do that if I just kind of go off the on the fly. So what I wanted to do is do some writing exercises with everybody to give you some practice on actually doing this. So I'm going to work, uh, run you through an exercise that you can use to actually find a hook, to find a title, find an idea, and then we'll actually do some outlining of what title you find, and then we'll do some sharing of what our outlines look like. So the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna do a five minute free write from your senses or a five minute object writing. So we're going to take five minutes and we're going to write um, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, movement, really try to describe the words that I give you in a very descriptive way and just don't think about it. Don't try to rhyme. Don't try to write lyric. If you see it in your head, try to describe it to us. And if it changes like path, if you start thinking about something else, chase that. It's all about just capturing what comes to mind. So for those of you who may not be familiar with what this type of writing looks like, I'm going to give you an example of one that I did about strawberries. Strawberries is not our word, but this is sort of an example of what I had written on the word strawberries in five minutes. So this is, um, and usually what I do is I write all the senses across the top. So in the middle of my writing, I can look up and say, oh, I haven't said anything about taste yet. So my strawberries writing said just outside of town out by the airport there's a field where you can pick your own strawberries you can see the airport off to the left there's a gravel road on one side and an oil highway on the other there's a sign that says pick your own the best time to go is just as the sun's going down shadows from the shelter belt loom over the rows of green plants uh, with dashes of red the air smells like summer that mix of plants dust and humidity you can smell the tar from the road and the exhaust from the cars that go by now and then. We grab some baskets and start out inspecting the rows for the biggest, reddest, and juiciest strawberries. There are grasshoppers and flies that move around us. We pick the berries and plop them into our basket. Your smile was a mirror reflecting the setting sun. It was like that flash was in slow motion and it took my breath away, those eyes smiling. So that's an example of sense-based writing and we're gonna i'm gonna set a timer uh for five minutes so if you guys have your writing things whether you're writing on paper or if you're typing um go ahead and get that ready and the word or actually a place that you're going to write about from your senses is a parking lot so the word is parking lot so I'll set the timer now and just go ahead and do your free writing and then we'll move on to the next step. So give it a go. So how how many um, how many song titles did some of you find? If you want to put it in the chat, I'm curious to see. Uh, Ron has three. Jen has three good ones. Cool. Victor has around six. Jeanette, six. Haley, two. Tamara, six. Four, four, six, three. First off, hopefully this show, Dory has four. 
hopefully this shows you that there kind of isn't necessarily a such thing as writer's block, right? Like there's always something to write about. All of you got multiple song titles out of the words parking lot, <laughs> right? So when you sit down to write, writer's block comes from your critic that wants to label everything as good or bad, right? So there's two parts to writing songs. There's the creation part, and then there's the editing and rewriting and critiquing part. The worst mistake that you can make as a writer is to go into the critiquing part too soon. You want to spend enough time being creative and just letting things fly before you actually start thinking about, is this good or bad? Because nothing's really good or bad. Um, it's just things are, right? So, um, oops, Dory, I think uh, getting point zeros there. Um, so next step in this process. So now that you ever, uh, Victor said he didn't, he didn't even think he could get the sense images from the prompt, but did you get sense images? Awesome. Perfect. So the next step in the process is take one of the titles that you have found and go with the one that sort of stands out to you as, you know, maybe one that that feels like it's it's wanting to be written, right? Like something that sparks a little bit of something in you. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that title and we're going to spend some time having you run it through this outlining process of what could your verses say and could you use that title to develop a full song from it. And you may find that your title isn't a strong enough hook to really be developed, which is totally okay, but usually try to look for an angle of how can you make this into something that's universal, something that's relatable, how can you run it through the who, when, where, what, and advance those things. So um, I'll probably give Give you a little bit more time on this probably about 10 minutes or so um, and then if we need more time we can take it but use this template of and remember the who where when and what and write each and all we're doing is outline so you don't have to write lyrics so you don't actually have to think about the song but think about how could you develop your hook and the title that you just came up with and how could you put it into this this outline. And I'm actually going to back it up to this one. So you remember kind of what to put in each um, section. So let's take about 10 minutes and then we'll come back and we'll kind of share the ideas on the outlines that you had and, and how you may develop your title and your hook. So um, I will set the timer here and uh, Go for it. Jen says lots of good ideas coming out of this one. Awesome. So let's um let's go ahead and if you want to finish up a little bit while we're while we're chatting and kind of sharing, but let's go to now um you know if you want to raise your hand and sort of read the outline that you have kind of what uh you know what title did you select and then sort of walk us through the progression of your song. And um, yeah, we can talk about it. And again, we're all here to support each other. It's it's okay. Um, don't be shy. You know, don't worry if it's if it's not your greatest work. It's all about learning the process. So, Victor, you want to go first? Sure. Whoops. Let me. Oh my God. Yeah. Sure. Um, um, Chad, you have changed my life. Um, I know. Ah. If you ago I told you in a past workshop I laughed at Pat Patterson when he described these um, these exercises the free writing you can I you know you can never make a lyric out of something like that it's a waste of time and then I heard Richard Johnson in one of you know one of you before I joined one night say how how it had changed his life and his whole approach to writing this is the first time I've ever done this um since i've been trying sense writing and and uh, free writing and stuff in the last couple of months to kind of lubricate up this is the first time i ever went through that the, the process 
So my first wow. images were very negative of a parking lot, um, uh, going back to old aging developments in my youth where, you know, things were, and, and I'll just go through th two or three of them to, so that the exercise makes, a, the outline makes a little sense, but black and yellow lines, right? Lines that have been painted over, um, frost heaves and cracks and grass growing where no life should be, um, mm. stench of asphalt, rusty poles, red letters gone to pink, right? That, that was what I scribbled down in the first. So awesome. I came up with the title, um, Long Gone. And uh, so the, the, uh, the outline goes like this. Um, verse one, when this was new, it was an emporium of dreams. And then the chorus would go, um, all things age and pass, but birth new, but their passing births a new beginning. Um, verse two, when the letters faded, then the letters faded, the metal rusted, the asphalt cracked, back to the chorus, all things pass, but new things come out of them. The bridge focuses on that image of the grass, grass growing where no life should be, and then back to the capitulation of the chorus again with, with now this emphasis on not so much what's past, but what may come out of something. Um, I don't consider this a ready-to-go song, but it needs development. But it's, it's interesting to me that I was able to cobble together a, an outline out of something I thought I couldn't even get sense images out of. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'm honored that I changed your life. That's awesome. Um, uh, I actually was very inspired by what you just said. Like, I could see you actually using that as not like a literal parking lot. But what if you use some of those adjectives to describe like a relationship? You yeah. know what I mean? Like, maybe it's about a relationship more than it is those physical items. So that's kind of where my head went. But does anyone else have any comments or or anything on what what Victor shared? I thought that was a I thought that was a great outline. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought I wrote something very similar to that, and uh, although it's the same concept, the words and the approach is completely different. So, uh, you know, I guess we think alike, uh, Victor. <laughs> uh, Ron, do you want to share yours? Uh, sure. Um, my title came out to be uh, "Potholes and uh, Faded Lines." Ooh, That's awesome. My the awesome so title. My, uh, so my first verse was back in the old days when bench seats were a style, we'd sit and talk, hug and kiss all night. Uh, the road was our domain and time had no end. Uh, we were to be together forever. Then the chorus was potholes and faded lines fill the roads of my life. Uh, things, things never stay the same and time does uh, end sometimes. <laughs> Verse two was, uh, I drive through country roads now alone with memories of, no, with faded memories of the way things used to be, um, and a hole in my heart. And then again, back to the, the chorus, uh, potholes and faded lines fill uh, the roads of my life. Things never stay the same, and time does end. Um, and then verse three was, when I pass the roads of... My old town, the smell of new tar fill my senses. The holes are filled. The lines are new. The ride is smooth. And you're thinking back to potholes and faded lines. You can right. continue that. Yeah. Well, the potholes were filled and yeah. the, the lines are new. Yeah. Um. So no more potholes, no more faded lines. No more. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah naturally, it's, it's a rough draft. So things would have to be worked out a little oh, bit. Oh, for sure. But... I love the title. That's an awesome title. I think that's a very a good, what they call a DNA title, where mm. it, it just holds images and it just has a lot of oomph to it. Yeah, kind of like agree. Watermelon watermelon Moonshine. Like that's another DNA right, title. Right. Um, Victor said his title was Faded Lines. Um, that's totally okay. There's millions of songs that have the same yeah. title. It's about how you, how you develop it. So um, Pierre, you had your hand raised. Yeah, we'll go for it. I'll jump right in. Title is My Brush with Greatness. Verse one, I was walking through the parking lot, going to the concert hall hours before the show, like I always do. It was set to begin. Looked around, and to my utter surprise, my hero, my musical hero, fill in the blank, whoever you like, was walking alone towards the stage door. I had to meet him. This was my chance. Chorus, I'll always remember that special night. My brush with greatness will always hold a special place in my heart. Verse two, I go up to him, say hello, 
He stops, smiles, and we chat. I can't believe this is happening. Just the two of us in the parking lot. Time stands still. Back to the chorus. Verse 3, he says and he, he needs to get to work. Hopes that I enjoy the show. Gives me a guitar pick that I hold tight and put to, on my heart. I float away to the front doors of the venue. Look forward to the show, which will probably be a magical night. My hero is everything and everyone that I hoped that he would be. And I want to, him to know through this song that I thank him. My brush with greatness. My brush with greatness. Cool. So the title's Brush with Greatness. That's cool. Something like that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. That's awesome that same topic that everybody started with, right? But your perspective was different. You were talking about an event that happened in the parking lot. So so that's good. Awesome. Thanks, Pierre. Uh, Jay, do you want to share yours? Yeah, sure. Um, so actually, I started more of the writing when uh, we did the initial thoughts and I just kind of went through a thought train. So on that, I have uh, half past two on Thursday, fresh from Wednesday, missed driving down unlike heavy rains, which could wash me clean, laid hood to windshield, hands clasped behind my the thick of my head. My clothes are headed towards soaked, just behind my mind, heavy from what my mouth said. Did she make it through the day? I watched her eyes bead as the cat or nine tails lashed from my tongue. And so that's when we went on to the section about finding titles. And so I actually just kind of took from there and then developed the title and kind of thought about the outline. And so for verse one, I just pretty much wrote um, hood of car, you know, where I'm where I'm at and uh, reflecting on the workplace. Yesterday, he spoke harshly and made them feel bad. Chorus two, the hook, which I haven't developed. Uh, verse two, me in the car driving, thunderclouds forming yesterday, thinking. Uh, then the next chorus. Then verse three, hood of car again, thinking of potential impacts of the person, never broke into full storm uh, above. It's just kind of like looming like dark overhead clouds. And I'm not really a huge bridge person, but this kind of this exercise for some reason really drew me to want to do a pre-bridge and then a bridge because it, it allowed me to kind of like do a pre-bridge where there's a lightning storm that forms and I can kind of write some things out to show realization. And then the bridge where the actual thunder breaks and then the heavy rains so that I can declare and commit to some resolutions. And then for the last chorus, uh, I can kind of, alter it a little bit but then have a fourth verse and i actually go back to work and resolve to ask the person uh instead of forgiveness whether or not they want me to remain at work or to resign that way it's at their feet so it's a longer form song but anyway that's kind of where it took me yeah so you kind of had this story that took you through kind of all of these different emotions from this event that kicked it off. And then I think, yeah, I think your next job is find out what that hook is, what that title is. Um, oh, the title is the epilogue. Oh, cool. Awesome. So then you just have to determine how do you say that so it relates to all of the verses for sure. Precisely. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Uh, Judith, do you want to go next? Not really, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Okay. The parking lot uh, to me meant uh, where we all are. And in my particular case, I'm at a point in life where I'm, I'm retired. I retired early. So the parking lot, uh, when I, the, the first uh, leg of this assignment was to just write stuff. And so I noticed that in, in number one, the word that I kept repeating was that special place in a parking lot where it's 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 near the door, it's near the elevator, it's near the stairs. And generally we know that that spot are, is, are for handicapped people. Not necessarily that I'm handicapped, but I am senior, let's put it that way. So it meant for me, the senior spot. So for me, that's, that's where I am in this parking lot. But still this parking lot represents where we all are perhaps in life, you know, uh, of course, you know, we, those that are further away from the entrance, 
uh, you know, they're they're younger, and of course, those of us that are closer are all the, are the older folks. So, um, and so, uh, as far as the development of it, the layout, I, I was all over the place. Um, I just have a start, and um, which is the parking lot. This is where I am in life, and I would imagine uh, that's that will be the chorus. The verses will be. I'm not quite sure, but um, well, I think I love the concept of parking lot as a metaphor for just stages in life. Like, I think that's brilliant. Um, that's not anything that I would have thought of, but I think you're on to a definitely a good start um, with a concept there for sure. I do have an ending though. And that is my, when I go outside of the gate, my territory will be large, you know, <laughs> just widen the territory, you know, so, and, yeah. and that, that's, that's all I have. So that's and awesome. That, and, and that's actually what's happening. I'm actually, uh, I have a lot more vision now and a lot more things planned, obviously. And I have more time to do those things. And that's what happens when you get older, I think. You know. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have to say that I'm a little jealous the fact that you're retired. <laughs> so I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> Um, that's my career goal is to retire. That's that's what it is. Um, thanks, Judith. Uh, Mark, do you want to go next? Oh, we got you on mute. Oh, yeah. Hi. There how we are go. you? Good. How are Hi, you? Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone's having a lovely morning. Uh, thanks for the structure. And uh, here we go. Uh, the title is uh, My Heart is Homeless. And it uh, first word was, um, it was hot in the parking lot. The smell of tar and oil filled my nose. The sweat from my shirt collected all of last week's dirt. The hard ground turned soft in the heat and the legs of my bench started to sink. They say home is where the heart is, but my heart is homeless on this parking lot bench. Um, the chorus is, I want to cry. And I know why my heart is homeless out here under the sky. If my life is for living, then why do I want to die? But my life won't let me. I have to live so I can die. And my heart is homeless under the parking lot sky. And the second verse is, I had a job once, a car and a home, a loving wife and a family tree. And the drugs and the alcohol came for me. I lost it all. It was a very slow fall. From the house in a corner lot to a home in a parking lot. And then, of course, the chorus again. And the final verse is, my church couldn't save me. My government forsake me. I think and I breathe like the best of us all. And yet it's not enough to save me from the parking lot at the mall. Wow. That was, that was very, um, like, I thought it did a great job of, of developing the story and and getting deeper as the song goes on. Like, I think it's really emotional and I love that. Thanks the, to your structure. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah, I think um, every time you would say, and then the next part, I was like, oh, it's getting me more. It's getting me more. So I think it accomplished that the goal of making it mean. And I also think it's a great title. I think that's an awesome, awesome hook, awesome title. So nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Victor Van He, do you want to go next? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I don't, I mean, I don't have a lot of lyrics. I mostly have just an idea with a kind of an outline, but um, the idea of the parking lot kind of made me remember a time in my life when I would go with my girlfriend to this, you know, old part to this parking lot behind a warehouse. And we would just, I think it was inspired by the watermelon moonshine. So we didn't actually have any watermelon moonshine, but we just taught, you know, had conversations and things. But so I was thinking about this and, um, kind of the first verse I was thinking would be kind of when the parking lot was new and the lines were clear um, so that this title, as I said, was faded lines. Um, and so when, when the parking lot was new, there were bright lines on the spaces, easy to see. We, we just knew where to park. And then I, you know, threw in things about thinking about the new, the new vinyl in my car, the smell of that and um, the, the new paint on the on the truck. Um, and then the second verse would be kind of when we kind of moved away <clears throat> and things kind of, you know, started to change. 
grass poked up between the cracks in the parking lot and you could still see the lines, but they were kind of faded. Um, you know, I forgot your number. So I'm kind of talking to the, the, the old girlfriend, you know, we all moved away, the warehouse shut down, um, the parking lot was empty. And then kind of the third verse is going to be like going back to that old parking lot and kind of seeing coming, coming home for like an autumn break and the lot is covered in leaves and now I don't know where to park the lines are faded so that that's kind of the idea I got it was yeah it's a great exercise I really made a lot more than I would have on my own so thank you <laughs> awesome well you're welcome um I love that idea of we knew where to park like I think there's something really powerful in that and then you brought that back of like now you don't know where to park because you can't see the lines like that's a awesome metaphor that I think you could really develop uh, into something cool. So awesome. Thanks, Victor. Uh, Haley, do you want to go next? Uh, no, but my therapist would tell me to, so I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, okay. Uh, similar to Victor, I feel like the sort of um, watermelon moonshine um, moment kind of maybe informed part of where my mind went to, but um, I had a very have a very specific memory with um, someone I dated years ago, like in my early 20s um, of a first date at a movie theater and just kind of like hanging out chatting in the parking lot. It was summer, so it was nice out, you know, whatever. Um, so that's what always comes to my mind and very rough, very rough kind of outline with no real lyrics. Um, I guess I kind of I don't really know what my title would be, but um, I think for the first verse, I'd probably write about, you know, obviously kind of setting the scene, like who it was my ex and I, obviously in a parking lot, just kind of like hanging out after a first date, feeling so happy, feeling so excited, you know, this is someone I really was into. Um, the chorus would be just kind of like expanding on that and like, talking about like that sort of first love and you know just how sort of overwhelming and all-encompassing that becomes um moving into the second verse i would probably talk about how that person and i years later we ended up not working out we ended up breaking up um and you know you kind of become frustrated with what this idea you have of a person and then who they actually end up being and so in that second verse just trying to kind of find a way to like vocalize the frustration and then i'd probably transition that into the neck the, the chorus again by having more of a sense of like oh like why can't you just be good the way you were the way it was when we had that first date and things were like fine like why like kind of like longing for that feeling again um and then I think probably for the third verse or the bridge, um, it would be more just, you know, flash forward now to my life now. And I've had, you know, other relationships since then and, you know, been in love a couple other times since then. And despite all of that, you know, love kind of ebbs and flows, I feel like now I just really sort of cherish that memory in my mind as something that just simply like makes me feel happy to think about like despite everything else that was associated with it at the time so i'd probably use the bridge to just kind of say or communicate somehow that like at this point now i'll just always cherish that memory and like in that parking lot um and then yeah use the the course the third time to just sort of drive that point home awesome yeah, so it sounds like you started in the past, right? And then you went to sort of where you're at now, and then you're saying, I will always cherish it. So you're kind of going past, present, future, which is awesome. So um, I think you did a really good job of of looking at what the, the song could possibly be. And once you have these outlines, writing the actual lyrics can sometimes be almost like filling in the blanks, right? Sometimes you just say what you want to say and get a draft and then go back and think of how can I make it better, right? So you're you're in the creative mind more than the, the critiquing mind when you're doing this. So nice job, Haley. Thank you. Thanks. Yep, thank you. Uh, let's go to Jeanette. 
Yeah. So when I, when you gave me parking lot, I thought about my ex picking me up at the same time frame. So it's just a rough draft. So the first verse would be, you are always here on a Friday afternoon to pick me up on a long day. There goes my baby. Always near a 7-Eleven. That's the title. Always near a 7-Eleven. So awesome. In the and then the course would be always near a 7-Eleven at the parking lot on the corner of Jefferson Park. There's my baby. Always near a 7-Eleven. Second verse would be, I know where to go every Friday night. You're always going to be there. Same spot. Memories of the same time slot. Here we go again. Always near a 7-Eleven at the parking lot. There goes my baby, always there at the 7-Eleven. That's all. <laughs> That's a super cool. That's a super cool um, title. And I think you could always also even go like even more into like this idea of thinking back, right? Like maybe your memories always come back, always near a 7-Eleven, right? Or I always think of you always near a 7-Eleven or, you know, like I think that's yeah. a really cool title. So thank you. Yeah. Very, very creative. Love it. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks, Chad. Uh, next up is Dan. And then we'll go to Tamara after Dan. Hey, everybody. Um, so I tried hard to write Joni Mitchell's Pave Paradise over again, but I didn't succeed at that. <laughs> um, so um, what, I, uh, what I did, though, was write about a, a big parking lot. And um, so the title is a uh, variation on even the breeze goes hollow. I'm trying to get the lifelessness. The breeze goes hollow, or maybe just even the breeze as the title. And the first verse is the nature viewpoint. It sets the scene. There's a gap in the trees where the birds are around the edges, but in the middle, there's nothing. It's just this blackness. Everything has been paved. There's no life. It burns your feet. It wrinkles your nose. Um, the chorus talks about the lifelessness. Um, it's a dark chorus, I guess. Um, a per, it's a permanent shadow where nothing lives, where even the breeze goes hollow. Um, verse two, it's me, first person. I've come back to the parking lot because it didn't used to be a parking lot when I was a kid. It was a field or a woods where I used to play. And the kids owned the place, and I shake my head about what happened. So it's nostalgic. It's looking back. Change of viewpoint. Um, and back in the chorus again and a bridge um, about what is there during the week. The, during the week, it's full of cars. It's people coming and going, something about, you know, baking in the sun. Um, and then the chorus repeat, and we're done. Awesome. Yeah, so kind of looking at the it it feels like a metaphor as well, but it's also kind of a very literal kind of thing that you're talking about as well. So nice. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Tamara, you're up next. Yes, well, um, the sound from the parking lot um, was um, one of the aspects of the sound from the parking lot, which was that it was quiet except the birds singing, was also true of the next place that we went to after that. Mike and, I, uh, Mike and I in the garden on a sunny day, enjoying being there. There's a lovely sense of calm here. It's totally peaceful. In this beautiful place, it's quiet except the birds singing. Mike and I have come here because of my Uncle Henry's 82nd birthday. It's a lovely day, sunny, warm, with lovely scents emanating from the flowering bushes all around. It's interesting to walk around here. In this beautiful place, it's quiet except for the birds singing. Mike and I are here in the cemetery where my uncle is buried, along with my parents and grandparents. In this beautiful place, it's quiet except for the birds singing. Wow, that was awesome. Um, I loved how it got deeper as the as it went on, and then it really gave me chills when you said it the last time. So that was that was amazing. Thank you. Awesome. Um, anybody else want to share what they had written? Adam, do you want to share yours? 
No. <laughs> I'm just picking on you. Uh, Judith. It's nothing special. <laughs> I, I just had a... Um, I, I've already had my turn, but as everyone was talking, uh, I realized I needed to have... I, I, I drew a picture. The parking lot, of course, had a beginning where everybody comes in and then it has that's the entrance and it has an outrance I'll call it where everybody goes out and of course that means life where we start and where we end where we start is not our choice where we start uh the things that we're given it's not our our choice but we are we do have a choice on how we go out and I just know I want to go out well and in the middle you know that's the development part of it so that that's that was just further development on that the parking lot of, of life i don't know I, don't, I still don't know what to call it so i love that concept of everybody you know like kind of everybody comes in the same way but we all have to choose where we park right like that's um and sometimes this our spots taken or the good spots taken so you have to make the best of it right so yeah i think you have a lot to play with um for sure on that um so what are your thoughts on kind of what we covered today um you know do you see yourself using this down the road as you're sitting down to write how do you see yourself kind of taking what we've gone over today and and taking it uh from here Haley you have your hand raised yeah I um as someone who has always loved to sing but have never like I've, i feel like i've never been able to sit down and write a song because i just always think like oh i get such writer's block and you know i feel like i've got a million things that i want to write about and no never know where to start so i feel like this has been great um i feel like the writing prompt exercise was really helpful and insightful and um yeah you made a great point of like you realize you have a ton of stuff to write about and then the rest sort of feels like kind of filling in the blanks so um yeah thanks so much what a labor of love to to coordinate this and do this for everyone and yeah very helpful so. oh you're welcome that's awesome feedback thank you uh victor well, I'm not, I'm not. um yeah I, I mean i'll build on what i said before is that what, what's enchanted me about this whole thing, I think where I would go from this basic outline is then to just, you know, take like four lines to say what it's free write, what I want to express in there, and then pull the images. So it's almost a, a, a kind of a reverse process. You start from just these images. And then so the songwriting becomes a journey in and of itself. And I had never really thought of it in those terms, I, that thought had occurred to me before today, but um, that that every song is is your own journey. So you start with these sense impressions, and then you kind of when you grab for your theme um, with the with the hook, that kind of gets you into the central idea. I'm also thinking about the song I sent you last night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, I've had some light bulbs go off, and and then you get even more and more specific. But then you kind of move out to, you know, you start to see where the whole thing develops from there as you build on it and develop it, right? Getting more specific and getting more universal um, as opposed to um, um, generic. So this is a this is a great, it's a liberating process. I've been doing it wrong for so many years. <laughs> well, you, what, what does Oprah say? When you know better, you do better or something like that? <laughs> um, well, thank you, Victor. Yeah, it's um, one of the things that I didn't mention, and I think this will resonate with people like Adam. Adam does a ton of co-writing. Um, if you can make an outline, the sooner the better within your co-writing session, it can make the writing process much more efficient because you know kind of what you're trying to say in each section, and it keeps you and your co-writer um, sort of on track. It becomes sort of your North Star of like, here's where we're going. This is what we're going to, what we're going to do. Adam says it's an alignment exercise. Absolutely. And as you look at um, writing songs like this, you know, some people would say like, oh, well, it's formulaic and like, it's a, you know, people don't think formulas work, but it's not really a formula. It's more of a skeleton, I think. And if you look at songs that you like, 
you'll see that they all kind of do this in a different way. So it's not telling you what to write. It's just giving you a hanger to put your code on, right? That's really what, what this is doing. So awesome, Victor. Thank you. Uh, Jay. Hey. Oh, there you go. Um, so I'd be hard pressed, Chad, to, to think about really any of the classes that I've had, any of the workshops that uh, I haven't found value in. Um, just the war chest of, of tools that you've given over over the span since you've had your platform has been just immense for me, uh, kind of really coming into the audio space at, at large. It's helped me to really not just work on my own stuff, but I guess you were just talking about really with uh, co-writing with Adam. Um, you know, it helps me when I hear someone who starts more from a musical end and they need lyrics, kind of hearing the tones that they're choosing, hearing what it infers, what it suggests, and doing outlines based upon that, working with them to help formulate narratives or stories to go along with that. Um, it's really just, it's, it's made me more valuable. And so I really appreciate you for that. Awesome. Well, glad that I can help. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Razzy, you have your hand raised. Uh, I just want to say I, I really enjoyed the uh, five minute exercises that you give us. Um, and it makes your mind just, you know, grow real quick in terms of how you're going to put a lyric together with the image. And, um, you know, I just um, posted one for you to share. Um, I just wanted to the title match the, the song in any type of way. So the rebound love, is that what you, that's what you had written? Yeah. Yep. So you have rebound love. You said from time to time, I've said this love is the one only to find out I was wrong sitting in the parking lot, trying to figure out what went wrong. Rebound love. I hear lovebirds singing. I'm watching people kissing as they pass by strawberries and cream uh, fill me up when feeling down. It's my delight that doesn't judge or hold regrets. Rebound love is I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping to happen next while reminiscing sitting in the parking lot. So yeah, I think that's really cool. I think Rebound Love is a cool title. Um, and I think that put, setting that scene of, you know, sitting in the parking lot where you said, um, from time to time, I've said this love is the one only to find out I was wrong sitting in the parking lot trying to figure out what went wrong. Like, th it that I know sounds literal, but I think to me, if you say I was wrong and now I'm sitting in the parking lot, it's almost like you got kicked out of the relationship and you're no longer in the building. You're actually in the parking lot. So I think that's really powerful. Nice work. Thank you. So as we start to wrap up today, any other questions or thoughts on what we have gone over or any um, anything that I can clarify or go over again for for any of you? If not, we'll wrap up for today, but I do want to remind you that coming up on July 12th, which is next uh, Wednesday, I think, um, I'm going to do a guided lyric writing exercise um, where we're actually going to kind of do step by step writing um, and we'll use some things we learned today, but we'll also um, learn some other ways to to really use the sense writing as well so i'll give you victor another way to make the the sense writing more valuable so hopefully that's helpful well thanks everybody so much for for this um the meeting on wednesday i think it's seven central it's either six or seven central let me take a look Got to get to my app here. Um, so it's 7 Central on Wednesday. Um, so definitely join if you can after Wednesday. Then uh, the next meeting after that is going to be um, our review meeting. So we've got our seven submissions. So we'll be doing um, live song critiquing and reviewing of other people's work. So make sure even if you don't have a song in, it's always good to learn and listen to, to feedback on other people's songs as well. So thank you all so much for, for joining and um, yeah, stay in touch and I will see you all very, very soon. Bye everybody.